countless stories and songs and poems and plays have been written about this. And innumerable drawings and paintings and sculptures and scenes from movies have been created in its name. 16th century poet and playwright William Shakespeare called it an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. He also called it a course that never runs smooth. Soul singer Dion Jackson said it makes the world go round. And Tina Turner asked, what's it got to do, got to do with it? <laughs> Rock legend Meatloaf will do anything for it, but he won't do that. And even 50 Cent asked 21 questions about it. Anyone want to guess what we're going to be exploring this morning? Love. That's right. Love. So much has already been spoken and written and created and done about and for and because of love. Today's sermon might seem a little redundant for some people, and yet it is vital that we as Christ followers consider not only what the artists and musicians and poets and our culture tell us about love, but we must consider what Christ says about the subject about what we are actually called to do about it. I'm Pastor Jess Horsley. I'm the Riverside Site Pastor here at Platwoods Church. I am grateful that you are here in person or online joining us wherever you are. We join together again this week with over 1,000 congregations from across our country as we keep the kindness campaign going. Last week, our lead pastor, Evie Martin, kicked off our campaign. We are in this Do Unto Others sermon series in which we are considering the current state of our country, of our world. We are considering how we are called to respond to the division and divisiveness, the anxiety and the anger, the fear and the lack of faith that seems to surround us all the time. And what we are called to do with our Christian virtues of kindness and respect, love, humility, and compassion. And so right now, today, we are going to explore this because I don't, I don't know about you, but right now, today, our world seems a little overwhelming. I recently saw someone say, I simply want to live in precedented times. Wars are raging across our globe, and there are mass killings in foreign countries, and there's violent weather and hurricanes, and tornadoes are raging, and books are being banned, and there's restrictions on medical care. The media seems more like entertainment than news reporting. Not to mention, and maybe you didn't know, but there's an election season happening around us, right? It's fraught with misinformation and meanness and disinformation and dissent. And all of this is happening all at once, all the time, all around us. What are, what are we supposed to do about it? What, how are we called to actually feel and how are we called to respond? Pastor Evie kicked off last week in our kindness campaign focusing on hesed, it's a Jewish word that means loving kindness. It's an attribute of who God is and how God lives out the relationship that God has with us, humanity, and how we are called to then live out our relationship with each other. Pastor Evie reminded us of the golden rule. Anybody want to give me a hint? What's the golden rule? Okay, that was a little weak. I'm going to say it. Do another. Do unto others as you would have others do unto you, right? Treat others the way you wish to be treated. Treating others with these first two values of kindness and respect. And so today, again, we continue with this third virtue of love. And I want to ask this question because I think it's important. Um, we have to ask it, right? It's the same question that Trinidadian German singer Hathaway once asked. What is love? No, no. Don't remember that one? Okay. Some of you remember. Some of you were around in the 90s. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. You, I know you were listening to that music. Some of y'all partied more than I did. We use the word love in a lot of different ways. It has a lot of different meanings. I mean, I love pizza, and I love my wife. Uh, and if I use them in the same sentence, it might not mean the same thing. 
or it might just be really good pizza. I love you, honey. But think about it, right? We use love a lot of different ways, and so we have to unpack what this means, and especially what it meant 2,000 years ago when Scripture was being written, because the ancient Greeks and and the New Testament's written in Koinia Greek, and so they have a lot of different words for this one word, love. There's mania. Some of us are familiar with this. It's obsessive, unhealthy compulsion, fanaticism even. It's about an object or an idea or a person even. It's a radical love that is experienced by everyone very rarely and by a few perhaps too often. And it is a rabid desire which can become and be violent. It's to be avoided if at all possible if we are to remain healthy. And then there's philautia. Philatia is this self-love, this self-care, and some have seen this as self-serving, and yet I think it's important we acknowledge that it is healthy and an essential part of who we are if we cannot love ourselves well and right and justly. How are we to love others? How are we to care for others? There's storge, this familial love. It's amongst relatives and parents and children, amongst siblings and kin, for some, it's present from birth, and for others, it's experienced later, or perhaps, perhaps never at all. It can be challenging, persistent even, in ways that we don't necessarily anticipate or appreciate, and yet, this type of love among family members, it's best given with no expectations, no hope for return or artillery, alternate, al- excuse me, ulterior motives. We simply give it to those who are around us. There's philia, friendly love. It's felt between and amongst and about friends. Those we choose to live alongside, those that we actually actively seek out as we be and become who we are, as we seek to find our purpose, as we discover those around us that we wish to spend the most time with. There's ludus. Ludos is this non-committal, carefree, playful, casual love. Some might call it a crush, a soft desire that seeks to be and become more. The ancient Greeks often thought that this ludos would lead to eros, this physical, passionate desire. It seeks pleasure and ecstasy and physical fulfillment. It's a type of love that when shared consensually, it can lead to great joy, And there are so many different types of love here, but there is one specifically that is mentioned in Scripture. It's this type of love that the divine has for you, that the divine has for each and every one of us as humans, this agape love. Agape, this conscious, unconditional, sacrificial, selfless love. It's a gift that is given without expectation or expecting anything in return. And so it's this agape love that we're going to explore and talk about today. It's this type of love, agape love, that Jesus models for us, invites us to experience, not only receive, but then give away as well. I wanna wanna point us towards the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 22. This is after Jesus has talked about, has told this story about radical inclusion. And this is after Jesus reminds people to give to the government what is the government's and to give to God what is God's. And so here Jesus is approached by the Pharisees. Hear these words. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had left the Sadducees speechless, they, the Pharisees, met together. And one of them, a legal expert, tested Jesus. Teacher, What is the greatest commandment in the law? Now, I want to pause here for a moment and think about this. Uh, It's a really great question, right? What is the most important commandment? What's the most important rule in your life? What's the most important law? Uh, And Honestly, it's like an opinion. Does anybody have an opinion about it? I mean, like, think about it a second, right? Does anybody actually know? Let me ask this. Does anybody actually know what the greatest law here in Missouri is? How How about this? Does anybody know actually how many laws there are in Missouri? I mean, seriously, anybody want to guess? Silence. I wish it was only 500, right? 300. Okay, I want to just throw this out there. 
uh, your guess is entirely as good or as bad as mine because no one actually knows. <laughs> Think about this during this political season. No one actually knows how many laws there are in any one place in any part of this country. Seriously. So I went to, to Senate.gov and I went to Mo.gov and then I used Google Analytics artificial intelligence, all right, and they actually have no idea. <laughs> no, seriously. There is no idea. No one actually knows for sure, even though they're really important, how many laws are actually anywhere, anywhere in the U.S. And so the question is to ask for a favorite. Like, which one's the best? Which one's the most important? All right? I, I think it's hilarious. Okay, let me, let's do this instead. Uh, how many, does anybody know how many laws are in the Torah, in the First Testament, right? There's a set of Jewish rules of laws. Does anybody want to guess how many there are in Torah? Oh, somebody's been through Disciple Bible Study. I love it. How many? 613. We have more in America, don't worry. 613, though. These are rules, these are, these are commands that the Jewish people use to live in relationship with each other and with God. And here is a Pharisee that is, is challenging, is challenging Jesus' authority, right? Teacher, tell me which one's the most important. Because if this one's the most important, then obviously this one isn't. He's looking to get Jesus in trouble. Let's, let's continue in Matthew 22. A legal expert tests Jesus, teacher, what is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus answers, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with your passion, your prayers, your intelligence. This is the most important, the first on any list. But there is a second that is set alongside it. Love others as well as you love yourself. On these two commands are pegs, and everything in God's law and the prophets hang from these two. Now, here's the beautiful thing, is these laws, these rules, these commands, they are not new to the people. This is Torah, the First Testament law. This is the Shema. The first is the Shema. It's found in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind. This was a common prayer that Jewish people would, would say each and every day. They knew this rule. But then, then Jesus goes and he recites another mitzvah, another rule, another prayer right alongside. And again, he pulls from Torah, Leviticus 19, 18. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against others, but you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself, for I am the Lord. So Jesus here is, is, he's not saying anything that people don't know. He's saying exactly what the people knew, but perhaps something that the people, the people take for granted. Love God, love each other, love your neighbor, period, hard stop. Everything else, everything else is minutia. But if we, if we know anything about humans, it's that we can make mountains out of minutia. We stand on issues rather than walk with each other. We build borders based on our beliefs rather than sitting together in circles seeking solace. I think I can say it's not difficult for most of us to understand this God-given command, love thy neighbor. Right, we understand it. In your, in your head, we get it. In your mind, you can think about it. And you're like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Love thy neighbor. Love other people. We can even believe it in our hearts, right? Oh yeah, I love, I love people. I love the people I encounter. I can, I can do that. I can love. In our very being, we can, we can, we can process this. But it's not the understanding or the belief that's difficult, is it? I mean, it's, it's the actual behavior. It's the actual practice. It's the actual doing of this command, of the living it out. 
Living this truth, love thy neighbor, living this way, right? Jesus invites us into living a specific way and living this way, loving others means opening ourselves up. Opening ourselves up even to being hurt mentally, emotionally, sometimes even physically loving others means learning and sometimes unlearning and relearning how to even love ourselves. I heard someone recently say, perhaps one of the reasons that we Christians have such trouble with this is that it says, love others as you love yourself, and maybe some of us don't love ourselves enough. We don't do any of this alone, by the way. Right? We're invited into community. It's important that we think about this. In her, in her book, Pleasure Activism, writer and facilitator, Adrienne Marie Brown says this. We need to learn how to practice love such that care for ourselves and others is understood as political resistance. And it cultivates resilience. We don't learn to love in a linear path from self to family to friend to spouse as we might have been taught. We learn to love by loving. We practice with each other on ourselves in all kinds of relationships. And right now, right now we need to be in rigorous practice because we can no longer afford to love people the way that we've been loving them. This kind of love is not sufficient. We can no longer love as a secret or a presentation, as something we prioritize or hoard for the people that we know. What we need right now is a radical, global love that grows from deep within us to encompass all life. In her book, she goes on to provide a brief love manifesto with four points, which should should sound familiar to us who follow Jesus. First, we have to have radical honesty. We have to invite ourselves and others to acknowledge our true need for love from real people and not the fake media or fake social media, fake news. Second, we must seek healing. Brown says we should celebrate love in our community as a measure of healing. The expectation should be, I know that we are all in need of healing, so how do we do our healing, this healing work together? Third, Brown says we have to learn to change. Most of us resist change that we do not initiate. You feel that? Most of us resist change that we do not initiate. By recognizing that change is one of the few constants in our life, we can change our perspective of change. We can learn to be a part of the change that is happening around us. We can live into it. And finally, we are called to build communities of care. We must shift from this individual transaction to collective transformation. We must make sure our gifts are available and accessible to those who are growing and transforming around us and them with us. This invitation must be to all people, to everyone. We must offer one another and all others this love and this compassion, this care that we have to share knowing that we might, we might have less at certain times and seasons in our life and more and more at times. This is all always done in connection, in relationship, in community. Brown concludes saying this, let our lives be a practice ground where we are learning to generate the abundance of love and care that we as a species long for. I don't know about you all, but it sounds a lot like what Jesus was teaching people 2,000 years ago. Yeah? We're invited into this, each and every one of us. And I hope that this sounds like what you and others are invited to experience here at Platwoods Church, at Riverside United, inviting all people into full life in Jesus Christ. That's what we're about. I mean, Jesus says in John 10, 10, Jesus says, I have come that they might have life, life to the fullest, full life. 
It's a question I've been asking a lot of people lately as I meet new people in the Riverside and North Kansas City areas, as I just say, what does full life look like for you? Ask yourself, what does full life look like for you? Because this is what agape love is supposed to be like, is this incarnate, embodied, lived out love. It's not just in our minds or in our hearts and our being, right? It's practiced in our hands and in our feet, in our words and in our actions, our social media posts, what we share with others, our phone calls, our daily practice, our rituals, our routines, everything about us is invited to be about agape love. Might we know and share this type of love that Mary J. Blige was looking for? You know I'm here, you know, right? A real love. You know what I'm talking about, right? Looking for a real love. Nobody else in the 90s? Come on, dang. Where all of us are invited to experience joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, these fruits of the Spirit. This, this is where our hope for the future lies, that all might know and experience and share these. Might you Might you know and experience and share these? Because when we give it away, it returns back to us and it returns back to God. In this season, no matter who you vote for, no matter who wins or loses, no matter what you see or what you hear or what others do, might you, might we all live with agape love. And this command that Jesus gave us, love God and love thy neighbor. May it be so. Amen.